Okay, so um, slightly quicker this one than the uh, presentation on pawn formation. And we're going to look at the center of the board. Um, it very much links in with the next one about active pieces, I, I would say. I could almost have done the two PowerPoints together, really, but um, for the sake of not making things too long, we'll keep them separate. So the center of the board in chess is very, very important. Um, classically, it used to be thought that you needed pieces and pawns actually in the center, but other grandmasters then in the sort of early 1900s decided that you could um, play to let the other player put his pieces in the center as long as you can counter attack it from a distance. But the point is it's about the fight for the center of the board. And um, if you wanted to think of it as like real life warfare, it's the same way armies tend to like to have the higher ground um, it lets you observe everything all around and it gives you quite an advantage in warfare generally to have the higher ground. So that's not to say that the edges of the ball can't be important or useful, but generally speaking, the player that controls the center is usually going to have a bit of an advantage. So let's have a quick look. So pretty obviously the center of the board is uh, D4, D5, E4, E5 and the uh, um, squares around it, the 12 squares around it as well could be considered central, especially if there's pawns there because they're pointing uh, towards the four center squares. So yeah, it's usually the most important part of the board. Generally the player who is in control of it, either from a distance or by occupying it, will tend to be in charge of the game. And so if you have a look at the following diagrams, think about how many squares pieces control from different parts of the board. And strangely, only the rooks aren't affected by this, but even they tend to be stronger once they can make it to the middle later in the game because, of course, they aren't blocked in by their own pawns. But anyway, let's have a look at a position. So here's two bishops. And the white bishop is controlling one, two, three, four, five, six, seven squares. Is it is at the edge of the board? The white bishop's at the edge of the board, controls seven squares. The black bishop is closer to the center. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven squares controlled. So that doesn't necessarily mean that the black bishop is better, but it does mean that the black bishop has more options. Let's have a look at the two knights. Very dramatically, um, it's very clear that knights tend not to be so strong at the edge of the board. There's always exceptions, but the white knight on a7 towards a corner has three possible squares. The black knight in the very middle of the board has eight possible squares. And in fact, if you put a knight in a very corner square, so a1, a8, h1, h8, then the knight is reduced to just two squares. So generally speaking, a knight placed in the center of the board is usually stronger than a knight tucked away on the edge usually and remember with positional play in chess there's always going to be exceptions to the rule but generally speaking knights are best in the middle of the board now here's an example of the rook which of course on an empty board it doesn't matter where you put it it will always have 14 possible squares if there's nothing else in place and a queen placed in the corner has 21 possible squares but if you place the queen in the middle suddenly there's an awful lot more squares. So there's seven there, seven there, seven there. So there's quite a lot of squares. I'll let you, uh, let's count it up, shall we? So four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. So far more squares. But of course, in the opening, you have to be careful. You put your queen in the middle of the board. She'll keep being hassled by weaker enemy pieces, but nonetheless, that should show the strength of the center of the board. And as I've just put there, just bear in mind, this is about guidelines. It's not an unbreakable rule, okay? But control of the center is usually pretty handy. So let's have a look at a position. Um, both sides have played the opening, but you should be able to see that black has largely neglected the center of the board. He's not losing in terms of pieces and the game isn't lost yet as such but he's definitely given white, uh, as we'll see in the next section, he's given white much more space to move around. And that's, so you can see white is definitely in control of the center, particularly the two knights and the black square bishop and the two pawns on d4 and e4. The black knights are totally 
disengaged from the action, aren't they? And it's interesting, if you count up the number of legal moves in this position, if you want to press pause, feel free. And white with 41, black with 31. Okay, so um, here's a classic position that comes up from an opening called the Roy Lopez, uh, or the Spanish opening. White, slightly more space, but this time black has played the opening properly and has a presence in the center. So much more evenly balanced than in the previous example. So although white's got the two pawns on d4 and e4, black has d6 and e5 pointing there. Um, the black knights are central. Uh, yeah, white's got the queen on d1, the rook on e1, which is pointing at the center of the board, but black's queen on d8 is there. And it's easy to put a rook on e8. So yeah, it's pretty balanced, this one. Once again, count up the legal moves and hit pause if you want to do that, just to see. And assuming I haven't missed any when I did this, white has 30, black has 29. So you can see that this control of the center, equal control of the center or balanced control of the center levels things up. And what have I put? Beware that just having lots of legal moves doesn't guarantee winning. You still need to choose the right ones. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so here's another kind of position that comes from an opening called the King's Indian Defense. And um, th this is one of what's called the hypermodern openings. And what they heat in these, one player is usually black, but will let the other side occupy the center on purpose and then try to break down the wall, break the pawn wall down, at uh, the pawn wall down. So in this position, for example, black's going to play c5 which is starting the counterattack. Um, you can see that that black bishop on g7 is on a lovely diagonal. Um, if the white pawn on d4 moves forward, you've got some real potential for black's uh, bishop from g7 to be quite strong. And so black's got 28 moves here, white has 34, but black is letting this happen because he thinks he'll be able to play to sort of break down and destroy this wall of white pawns in the center. So it's a, it's a way for black for uh, to play a counter-attacking chess, if you like. So, okay, that's a very, very, very brief overview of playing for the center. And again, generally speaking, if you're stuck for other ideas, um, start to think about whether you can improve control of the center or whether you can do something about weakening your opponent's control of the center. Excellent stuff. Okay. Um, enjoy your chess.